This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. From a Roman military camp called Vindabona through its imperial heyday that gave us all this Baroque beauty, Vienna has so much to be curious about. Remember when you were a child and all you ever asked was why, why, why? Well, I never quite outgrew that whole quest for knowledge phase. In fact, I've made a career out of asking who, what, where, why, and how as an arts and travel reporter for the past 20 years. So, if I have an insatiable curiosity about the exciting, inspiring, beautiful world of art, architecture, and hidden history all around us, I bet you do too. This isn't your typical what to do on a vacation travel show, oh no. This is your all access pass to a deeper understanding of the world's great art and architecture, people and places, history, and how did they do that. So, come along on our educational journey, our field trip for grown-ups who have never quite grown up, and learn with Curious Traveler. Vienna is easily one of Europe's most beautiful cities. In fact, I dare you to try to find an ugly building around here. Its architecture is almost exclusively Baroque. Why? Well, because of its curious imperial history. Willkommen in Wien. Vienna, the architecture, the music, the coffee, and the soccer torta. Rivaling Paris as Europe's most beautiful city, with centuries of royal history, you can't help but feel a little royal yourself as you wander this beautiful city. Vienna was once the center of a major European empire, covering thousands of miles, ruled by one royal family for hundreds of years. And where there are royals, you need entertainment fit for royals. So it was only natural that Vienna also became a world leader of culture and classical music. So, here's what I'm curious about in Vienna. Why are there so many giant, ornate public buildings all in a ring around Vienna? Who were the Habsburgs and Maria Theresa and Sisi? Where did a six-year-old musical genius perform? When did Austria shrink to a tenth of its original size? Why did Francis II become Francis I? What is this Greek goddess doing in Vienna, and what do these eagles symbolize? And most importantly, how do you take in all of Vienna's beauty at once? Let's begin our curious journey into Vienna's imperial history, at the heart of the city and the heart of the empire, at the sprawling palatial complex known as Hofburg. The Hofburg is one of the largest royal palaces in all of Europe, with 18 wings, 19 courtyards, and 2,600 rooms. Hard to believe it all began as a humble medieval fortress. And you can still see remnants of its medieval beginnings here in front of the palace. Like many European cities, Vienna can trace its roots to early Celtic and Roman settlements. I guess if the location is good, just keep building on top of it, right? The original castle dates back to the 13th century, and Hofburg just kept expanding and expanding and expanding through the 19th century. But apparently, even this wasn't enough space for the royal family, because there is a summer palace too, a sunny yellow one called Schönbrunn. <laughs> Schoen Brun translates to beautiful fountain, and this area here actually has some very humble beginnings. First, it was just a farmstead, and later on, a simple hunting lodge. But once Maria Theresa got a hold of it, she did quite the makeover. Maria Theresa was the only female ruler of the Habsburg Empire. When she wasn't redecorating Schoen Brun, she was busy ruling her empire for four decades of the 18th century. During her reign, she had several wars waged against her, some to contest her right to rule the Habsburg territories. How rude. But no problem, she dealt with it all and went on to reform the government, improve the military, and increase Austria's overall wealth. She also married for love, not power, which was rare at the time, and had 16 children. 
one of which was the legendary Let Them Eat Cake, Marie Antoinette. In between all that, Maria Theresa received Schoenbrunn Palace as a wedding gift. Beats a set of steak knives, right? And it was here in 1762 that a very important moment for Vienna and the world happened. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. We have tons of exclusive documentaries about the most important people in history that you will not find anywhere else. There is a great collection of religious history content available to History Hit subscribers, from the Crusades to the birth of Islam. There are plenty of topics to choose from for your next documentary fix. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Parable fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code PARABLE at checkout. Leopold, a very ambitious uh, musician, he uh, presented his uh, young boy, a six-year-old child prodigy. Mozart, he gave a concert here at Schönbrunn Palace in front of Maria Theresa, and they were highly rewarded. Maria Theresa was a singer herself, and because of her love of music, Mozart returned to perform in Schönbrunn many times. We will explore his curious life in Vienna's music legacy a bit later. But back to that Habsburg dynasty, about a century after Maria Theresa, one of her descendants, Austria's legendary emperor, Franz Joseph, was born here at Schönbrunn Palace. Emperor Franz Joseph ruled longer than any other Austrian emperor, 68 years in total. Now, Schönbrunn Palace has more than 300 rooms, but what's interesting is that Franz Joseph chose to live most of the time in two small rooms. This was one of them, his bedroom, and look how small his bed is. Of his many accomplishments, Franz Joseph's legacy includes helping to form the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And on a much lighter and prettier note, he is also known for marrying the most beloved empress in Austrian history, with a cute little nickname. Empress Elizabeth was known as Sisi, and also known for her beauty, her charm, and her long, long hair. There's even a popular movie series about her. Sisi was widely loved and adored, kind of the Princess Diana of the 1800s. She traveled the world, charmed heads of state, wrote poetry, and defied convention, including battling her meddling mother-in-law. Sisi remains an Austrian icon today. But before Empress Sisi, before Franz Joseph, even before the Austrian Empire, Austria can trace its roots back to the Middle Ages and one of the most powerful royal families in European history the Habsburgs. They came from a territory which is today is part of Switzerland. And in the yeah, 1278, they got control about the territory, which is the core of today's Austria. And then they very slowly started to build up an empire. The Holy Roman Empire, it's not a nation as you would uh, think of it today. So actually the French philosopher Voltaire put it quite uh, into a nutshell when he said, the Holy Roman Empire is neither uh, holy, nor Roman, and not an empire at all. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the Habsburgs ruled over that non-holy, non-Roman, non-empire for centuries. Although the titles of those rulers changed in the early 1800s, when Francis Napoleon I started causing trouble in Europe. So a Habsburg descendant named Francis did something drastic to save the empire. He ended it. And what's even more curious, this particular Francis was born Francis II, but died Francis I. What the heck? How did Francis II become Francis I? Because that doesn't normally happen. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's a typical Austrian <laughs> solution. So he's Francis II as the Holy Roman Emperor and Francis I as the first Austrian Emperor. Excellent. He just didn't want to be number two. He wanted to be number yeah. one. That's all it was. And it's important to note that this Austrian empire covered a whole lot more than just modern day Austria. At its peak, it covered 10 times the size of today's country. Starting from the west to today's Austria, uh, then portions, huge portions of northern Italy. Uh, then uh, in the north, there was uh, all of today's Czech Republic, the decisive parts of southern Poland all of Slovakia, all of Hungary, the western portion of the Ukraine, then uh, two-thirds of today's Romania, then uh, all of Slovenia, 
than Croatia and also the northern part of Serbia, also Bosnia and Herzegovina. Oh, is that all? So how and why did this huge empire split apart? Well, a growing resentment towards imperial rule and a little thing called World War I happened. In October 1918, the various nations, the various ethnic or language groups of the empire started to declare themselves independent. And here's where it gets really interesting. After those little states were created, there almost wasn't a little Austria left at all. Austria actually was then uh, nicknamed uh, the country that nobody wanted because <laughs> at the time actually even the Austrians, people were not so convinced about the viability of this so much smaller country. In part because the smaller country was incredibly vulnerable after World War I, as the world crept towards World War II. And so there was a very strong tendency of being fused or merged with uh, Germany. So, after two world wars and some serious downsizing, Austria had a bit of an identity crisis. So, it is no surprise that today's Austrians and Viennese like to identify with happier times and the proud legacy of their Habsburg and imperial roots. Especially as a Viennese person, you always have this Habsburg background, the history background, you always feel like still, especially when you wander along the Ringstrasse, you think that Austria is still a power that matters, which we don't. <laughs> but you know, you live on the, on the backdrops of an empire. What is this Ringstrasse our Viennese friend speaketh of? It is the Oso Grand Boulevard of Vienna, a circular one, hence the name Ringstrasse or Ring Street. A grand project of grand buildings, parks, and gardens all began around 1858 under the reign of Franz Joseph. Much like Paris's Haussmann project, Vienna's Ringstrasse tore down the old city to erect the new. While the ring follows the medieval city walls, those actual walls were torn down. Only a few fragments of the original wall still remain. Like I said, throughout history, if the location is good, just keep building on top of the same spot. As you play Ring Around the Strasse, you'll see each public building is a temple dedicated to its function. From a temple to music, the Vienna Opera House, to a temple to the Empire, the Hofburg Palace. And instead of one style for all the buildings, the Ringstrasse is a gorgeous gallery of all different European architectural styles, beginning with Greek and Roman. The Parliament buildings are perhaps the most stunning of the Ringstrasse buildings. And you can't help but notice it kind of looks like a Greek temple, right? Well, that's no accident. Not only was neoclassicism the architectural style of the time, but the architects wanted to make the statement that the Austro-Hungarian Empire was just as powerful as Greece or Rome. And standing proudly at the entrance, we have the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And at her feet surrounding her, we have four allegories of the four rivers of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Next around the Ringstrasse, we start to see double. This is the beautiful Kunsthistorisch Museum, or Fine Arts Museum, built between 1871 and 1891 to house the massive art collection of the Habsburg family. Now, the building itself is just one of the many beautiful Baroque buildings as part of the Ringstrauss project. In fact, the architecture was so popular that... They built a duplicate, that's right, it's twin, right across the plaza. And this building is the Natural History Museum. And right in the middle is our friend Maria Teresa, still holding court high above Vienna. Next, for something completely different, Vienna's beautiful city hall is a little bit different than the other buildings along the Ringstrasse. Whereas many of them are the Baroque style, this one is neo-Gothic and was modeled after many other beautiful Gothic churches and secular buildings found across Europe. Now, in German, city hall translates to rat house. So if you hear someone referring to the rat house, know that is not a commentary on politicians being rats. Last but not least, all the way at the top, we have a beautiful statue called the Rat House Man, which came to be the beloved symbol of Vienna. And just across from City Hall is Vienna's Temple II Theater. 
The Berg Theater was the last of the beautiful buildings to be built here along the Ringstrasse. We have all around the building gorgeous decorations of playwrights and literary figures from throughout the centuries. At the top, we have the god Apollo with the muse of tragedy on his right and comedy on his left. And inside, we have gorgeous paintings by Gustav Klimt, Vienna's favorite artist. Now, for our last building, remember how the medieval wall was torn down for the Ringstrasse? Well, there are a few medieval buildings still standing within the Ringstrasse, and there is one that stands taller above the rest. St. Stephen's Cathedral is a beloved icon of Vienna, and it is believed the version that we see today is the third church to stand on this very spot. The most interesting feature, of course, are those twin spires. You can see the south one here that extends all the way into the heavens with the gold on top. And then, of course, the matching north one on this side at the exact same height. Oh, wait, that one was never finished. Why wasn't it ever finished? Well, there are many legends about that, including financial troubles, the threat of a Turkish siege, and plain old this Gothic style has gone out of style problems. So today it's fun to ponder all these possibilities. But more importantly, St. Stephen's Cathedral is the symbol of Vienna. The original church was built in the 12th century and has a quite curious history. It was severely damaged by fire during World War II, but miraculously rose again in just a few short years. Lovely St. Stephen's Cathedral has stood tall in the center of Vienna's inner city for more than 700 years. Joseph Haydn was a choir boy here, and Mozart got married here. And that unfinished North Tower was capped with a Renaissance spire and houses the largest bell in all of Austria. That soaring south tower is still the highest point in Vienna's inner city. But most curious of all is St. Stephen's Cathedral's rooftop with 230,000 multicolored glazed tiles. On one side, there's a double-headed eagle and the other, two single-headed eagles. Why? Well, the double-headed one represents the Habsburg Empire symbolizing many things, including its rule over East and West, rule granted by God and the elected people, and later the dual monarchies of Austria and Hungary. And what about those single-headed eagles? This one on the left is the coat of arms for the Republic of Austria, with the one-headed eagle representing Austria's sovereignty. It is often depicted with broken chains at the eagle's feet, symbolizing Austria's liberation from Germany in 1945. And this one on the right is the city of Vienna's coat of arms. The shield on the eagle's chest with a white cross over a red background is believed to have been part of the seal of Vienna since the 13th century. All that heavy history surrounded by light and mirth here at Stevensplatz at Christmas time. So let's continue with some light and mirth and beautiful classical music, which Vienna is known around the world for. From the 16th to the 20th centuries, music wasn't just a light pastime here. It was a status symbol for the imperial family of Austria. And Vienna became a leading European center for music with names like Strauss, Beethoven, and Haydn. And that fine music legacy continues today. Going to see a classical music concert in Vienna in a setting like this is as common as going to the movies. And this luxurious setting is the lovely Palais Augsburg. Built between 1706 and 1710, it is considered Vienna's oldest Baroque palace. And it is a pretty darn perfect place to listen to the world's best classical music because not only did Emperor Franz Joseph attend balls here, but some of the world's best composers performed here, including a very special one named Wolfgang. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is one of the greatest composers in the history of classical music. The Magic Flute, Don Giovanni, The Marriage of Figaro, and The Haunting Requiem. 
Mozart is universally considered a musical genius. It is believed that Mozart began playing music at the age of three. And as an adult, his genius flourished as he was able to create music in all the different genres of his time. And his impact on Vienna is as grand as his music. Even today, you can't pass a corner in Vienna without seeing something Mozart, especially tasty Mozart Kugel chocolates. Ugh, but I digress. But Mozart was born in Salzburg, so why is he so linked to Vienna? Well, the perfect person to ask that question to is our guide at the Mozart house, who just happens to have the same name as Mozart's wife, Costanza. What brought him here to Vienna? He came here because his uh, then boss, the Salzburg Archbishop Hornus Colorado, told him to come to Vienna and to work from Vienna for him. But then again, Mozart was a very freedom kind of loving person and he was really fed up this badly paid position. So he had a little bit of luck maybe because he had a huge fight with the Archbishop and then he just said, okay, here in Vienna I can become a freelance composer. And he became one. Oh yes, from the beginning, the only thing that rivaled Mozart's talent was his rebellious spirit. While it was a struggle at first, eventually Mozart thrived in Vienna, calling it, quote, the land of the piano. And some of his most famous works were performed for the first time here in Vienna, and written here in Vienna too, some of them in this beautiful little 17th century apartment. This is the apartment of Mozart. Uh, Mozart spent his last 10 years of his life in Vienna and during the time he moved 13 times. So he had 14 apartments. This is the only apartment which still exists today. All other apartments are gone. And he moved in here on the 29th of September in 1784. And he moved out again on the 23rd of April in 1787. So he lived here for over two and a half years, which was the longest time he spent in an apartment. But why did Mozart move so much? Did he just have fickle tastes? Needed new inspiration for each composition? Nope. The reason was much more practical. He never saved money. If he had money, he just spent it all. And so sometimes he had to move to small apartments. He was known for that, for the, for the money he would get. He would spend it out on, you know, parties and, and all sort of, you know, unsavory things. Yes. He, he had a good time, but whereas maybe we think of him as this very serious genius. He was yes. not a serious person at all. No, he was very, very funny. Uh, he loved to make jokes and he uh, loved to make up names for, for people. And, uh, but he also worked very hard. I think that's very fascinating about him. And you can see some of his most famous works here at the Mozart House Museum. During the time he lived here, he composed so many pieces like the opera Le Nozze de Figaro, uh, eight piano concertos, so sonatas and uh, quartets. So many things were composed here. It's unbelievable how he did it. And today, you can stand in the very same room where Mozart would try out his new works for his friends. But in this room also, house music evenings would take place. So um, string, uh, people for string quartets would come in and play the new uh, music of Mozart. He would invite his friends, guests, and they would listen to the music. So this all happened in this room. That's exciting. So it's possible that he was sitting in this room, looking out down this same very street, Sure, he did, yeah, because the view you have here is an authentic view because the houses to your left and right were still standing, um, were standing 250 years ago as well. So, um, yeah, you have the same view that Mozart had. And today, you can almost hear Mozart's music still spilling out of this window onto the streets of Vienna. From a Holy Roman Empire that was neither holy nor Roman nor really an empire, to a once humble Celtic settlement and Roman fort that became the royal palace that just kept expanding and expanding and expanding. To a hunting lodge built on a spring that became the sunny summer palace where young Mozart gave a concert for Habsburg Queen, whose descendant changed his name from the second to the first and created a new empire, which paved the way for Austria's longest reigning emperor, who put a ring on Austria's most beloved empress, and another type of ring around beloved Vienna, that followed those medieval walls and then decorated it with temples to music, art, science, culture, government, and of course, the people. 
in all manner of shapes, styles, and symbols. And inside that ring is a proud vestige of those medieval days, a church with a wonky tower, and important symbols of Austria's turbulent history. And just steps away on a lovely little street, if you close your eyes, you just might hear the music of an Austrian-born musical genius trying out his latest composition inside this precious apartment above. Vienna has so much to be curious about. Thank you for joining us on our educational journey and hopefully now you're even more curious about the who, what, where, why, when and how of Vienna. As they say here in Austria, Auf Wiedersehen!